Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lynn Marsden Atlas, Executive Director of the Arthur Ross Gallery. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here today to have a conversation on Doc's Thrash with Dana Rice and Allie Davis. Allie is a second year master's student in the school, the Weitzman School of Design, and her focus is historic preservation. And Dana Rice is a project architect for Cicada Architects and Planning. And she is a 2016 graduate of the School of Design. Today, we're having a conversation about the African-American artist, Doc Thrash, and the Doc's Thrash House Project. I wanted to mention that as this is in, in part a series of conversations that we're having in relation to the exhibition, Many Voices, Many Visions. And I'm going to show you an image right now of the, the print by Doc's Thrash, Masks 1938, which is a, a carbundum etching in the current exhibition at the Arthur Rust's Gallery. Doc Thrash has been renowned from the time he began exhibiting in Philadelphia. He was an important member of the Pyramid Club. Uh, he worked for the WPA and the Fine Printing Workshop here in Philadelphia as part of the WPA project. And now I would like to turn it over first to Allie Davis, who's going to give us a little bit of background on the artist Doc's Thrash. Okay, let me know if that's not visible. That's great. Um, okay, great. So um, the, just to kind of preface, um, the, the Philadelphia Museum of Art has a lot of Thrash's works and information about his life, if anyone's interested to learn more. Um, but we'll go through a little bit of of his life. He was born in Griffith, Georgia in 1893 to Gus and Ophelia Thrash. Um, many of his works reflect life in rural Georgia, um, showing uh, what the poor rural aspects of African American life, but really focusing on how um, family and community united the lives of those people and really that they had that enrichment in their lives. Um, he began studying art at the age of 14 and moved north uh, during the Great Migration at a time when many Southern African Americans were moving north. Uh, he also depicts scenes of this kind of migration in his art later. He reached Chicago and was accepted to the Art Institute there, um, but his studies were interrupted uh, when he enlisted to fight in World War I. After leaving the military, he um, joined a, a traveling vaudeville act through the Southern uh, Plantation Circuit, um, which again, influenced a lot of his art. Uh, but then he re-enrolled in the Art Institute in Chicago, where he studied with um, African-American artist, Edward Scott, who really became his role model. And he supported himself with some odd jobs and studying commercial art and mural design. Um, he came to Philadelphia in 1926 at the height of the Harlem Renaissance and located himself uh, in the Sharswood neighborhood, which at that time was Philly's, known as Philly's Harlem, since it was the center of jazz and black art and culture. He befriended Samuel Brown Jr., who was the head of the Informal Art Association for African Americans called the Tra Club, which he joined. And the two of them shared a studio space on Columbia Avenue, which is now Cicel B. Moore Avenue. He also um, worked in a print and advertising shop where he started to gain some fame and notoriety. He was influenced by other African American etching artists where um, such as Earl Hoarder at the Graphic Sketch Club, uh, James McNeil Whistler, and Winslow Homer. He really became involved in um, portraying the dignity of African American bodies and life uh, to try and counteract some of the negative representations through mainstream art. Um, he had his first solo exhibit in 1931. 
Um, and then in 1937, he um, came to work at the fine print workshop um, through the, the Federal Arts Project Program, which is where he invented um, the carborundum process, which he became uh, very famous for. He also joined the Pyramid Club, which was an African-American professionals, cultural, civic, and social advancement club in Philly. Um, in 1941, he became so famous for his art that he started to have exhibits across the whole country um, and really spoke out um, at that time because he was refused a job at the Navy Yard in Philly because he was black um, and used this as a way to start his kind of more uh, uh, outward vocal uh, activism to fight um, racism. Um, in 1944, he bought um, what is now called the Dax Dax Thrash House that we advocate for with his wife, Edna, in Shars Wood. It was across the street from the studio that he shared with uh, Samuel Brown. Um, and he uh, later sold it in 1949 when he kind of semi-retired so that he could move closer to the Pyramid Club. Um, he also moved his studio to Ridge Avenue. So his entire life really focused, his entire uh, life in art really focused on depicting um, the life and bodies of African Americans with beauty, grace, and dignity during a time when lynchings and segregation were pretty prevalent um, and called out racism wherever he could. Yeah, and just to like add, um, kind of just giving you more context about sort of the neighborhood at the time. Um, so this is 1925, so this would be, you know, around the time that he first arrived in Philly. And kind of like we said, it was really a big burgeoning arts and cultural hub, especially for the African-American community. At the time, there were um, lots of theaters, like the Pearl Theater, where Pearl, Pearl Bailey was discovered at in the neighborhood that no longer there. Um, the Checker Club was a really well-known social club that is, it's still there, but it's kind of hanging on <laughs> very precariously. Um, and then again, like we mentioned before, the building that the Pyramid Club is on, Girard Avenue. Um, so that building is still there, which is good. Um, Girard College is also a pretty significant. Um, there were, in the 1960s, protests to um, fight segregation of Gerard College and even MLK came and spoke there. Um, and of course, Athletic Square is also still there today. So it's just kind of giving you a sense of sort of not just how historically significant the Docks Thrash House is, but really the neighborhood as a whole and like why it's important for the legacy of African American peoples in Philadelphia. So, Thank like you, said, Dana and Allie. Allie, you already answered my second question. So this is terrific. Um, and I was going to ask you about the Pyramid Club and his role in the WPA. But yeah, I can go a little more detail into that as well. Okay. Um, That'd be great. Yeah, so the Pyramid Club, um, uh, Doc's Thrash became very active. Um, during his lifetime, there were very few places where African-American artists could display their work and the Pyramid Club became one of the places to show African-American art. Um, and in his later life, part of the reason he sold the Docks Thrash House and moved closer to the Pyramid Club was so that he could take a much more active role um, in promoting, um, using it as a, as a space to promote um, you know, equality and, and activism for African-American rights. Um, and then um, during his time with um, the fine print workshop and the federal arts project, um, that's where he, because this was a government funded program, artists who were employed through the program could really take a lot of time to focus and work on their art and uh, experiment, which is how he came to invent the carborundum process, 
by um, experimenting with the, the carborundum traditionally used to, um, to work on lithograph rocks, I think. And um, instead he used it on copper plating. Right. And um, with that process, he was able to uh, play a little bit more with a wider range of like pale gray and almost white um, all the way up to these really dip, deep, rich, velvety blacks, um, which, uh, you know, became a very powerful tool for him to illustrate the variety and tonality of black bodies to show that it, they're not a monolithic group as um, mainstream media was portraying them. It became a much more sympathetic tool for him to uh, present positive um, images of African-Americans. And he actually referred to the prints as Ophelia graphs after his deceased mother. And I also think it's kind of interesting to point out that the current photograph that we're showing of Doc Sash, um, he would often um, kind of mentor younger generations of artists too. So he was brought on to do be like a juror on some of their um, galleries that they would have. Um, but the photograph I believe is from uh, John Mosley, who is another famous Philadelphia photographer, African-American and kind of similar to how Doc Sash, you know, in his work would use his medium obviously to paint a very sympathetic and realistic portrayal of African-American life at the time. John Mosley would also photograph a lot of like everyday and significant occurrences in African-American communities in Philadelphia at the time. So it's kind of interesting that they kind of both do the same thing but are doing it through different mediums. And it's kind of part of this bigger movement in the arts community at the time. So. And certainly he, you know, he followed the um, the philosophies of both uh, Elaine Locke and the New Negro and W.E.B. Du, du Bois in terms of presenting the, the strength, the resilience, the beauty of um, um, the Black image and, and, and the life of, of African-Americans at the time, uh, very important. One of the things I wanted to add is um, many of you will know that there has been a retrospective uh, at the Philadelphia Museum of Art um, in, the, in, I think it was 2001, um, that was a large retrospective, but what I actually discovered was that in the 1940s, both the director of the PMA and Carl uh, Zagosa uh, decided to, to actually acquire works by African-American artists. And there are, today there are 50 works in the collection of the, in the prints and drawing collection at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, um, as well as at PAFA. And we actually only have one in Penn's collection at the moment. So Dana, in 2016, as a graduate student at Penn Design, you became interested in the Docks Thrash House in Charleswood. And under the, um, and together, uh, three of you sort of banded together to do a studio project, I believe. And you held community meetings after you became a graduate in 2016. You extended, if you will, the study project that you had around the Docs Thrash House and began to create a community meetings and community feedback for what might happen with the Docs Thrash House. Can you tell us more about those and the community goals for the house? Um, sure. Uh, and I think like maybe, first of all, it, it, it kind of makes sense to maybe sort of dive into how we kind of got started with our project. So, um, so actually, could you go back a couple of slides? Um, just to give some background. So yeah, in 2016, myself, and um, actually, I guess it was the fall of 2015. Um, as part of a pen preservation studio, we were tasked with looking at 
the Sharswood neighborhood in North Philadelphia. And this, well, this is kind of more closely what it looks like today, which is significantly just different than the map we saw earlier from 1925. And so kind of after sort of this heyday time frame of sort of cultural re renaissance in the neighborhood, the area kind of underwent significant changes. And, you know, it's kind of a typical sad story, I think, of a lot of neighborhoods in Philadelphia where, um, you know, white flight happened, um, there was disinvestment in neighborhoods, there wasn't a lot of opportunities and resources for the Black populations left in the cities to kind of deal with their neighborhoods and maintain their buildings. There is redlining, there was segregation, and you know, all these different things. And on top of all that, one thing Charleswood also had to deal with was um, large uh, public housing that had went up in the 1969, 1970, right in the middle of the neighborhood. So that's kind of that I guess you can't see my point over yeah that gaping hole in the middle of the neighborhood and so at the time when we started the studio the philadelphia housing authority was kind of undergoing this massive what they call transformation plan to kind of overhaul the entire neighborhood and kind of redevelop their existing public housing in sort of a lower density um, development that stretches across the neighborhood and so we were kind of taking in our studio taking a lens to that through historic preservation and thinking about kind of what the implications of that would be on the existing historic fabric and the existing residents of the neighborhood and so that's kind of when we got um Mayan and I were became familiar with the Doc Thrash house it kind of stood out at the time especially because it was one of the only locally historically protected and designated buildings in the neighborhood. And then also one thing that was really unfortunate is in our research, we just found out that there were all these amazing stories and histories like the Pearl Theater and in other buildings that just, you know, you would come across them and then you would wonder, oh, you know, what's, how's that building doing today? And it turns out it's, it's gone. And so there's definitely kind of this sense of loss and like degradation that I think is is happening in the neighborhood that is felt really deeply by the residents. And so having this remaining landmark in there, the preservation of that has become like immensely important for the community at large. So if you want to move forward. So oh go back. <laughs> um, I want to do I want to do each slide. I'm sorry. Um, so, re, so today kind of on top of that, there's immense development pressure coming in from all neighborhoods surrounding it. And there's a lot of speculative development happening. And um, so you can move forward. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, and so that's kind of what happened with the house was that um, at the time, well, yeah, so after we graduated, we decided to kind of take on the house on its own as a preservation project and try to, you know, figure out as best we can a way to, if, if not advocate for get the preservation of the building itself, that we wanted to try as best we could to preserve Doc Thrash's legacy. So next slide. <laughs> um, so we, that's kind of when we started what we called Stars with Thrash for these sort of community meetings. And kind of the goal in mind was because at the time we really didn't know that the house the, had a tangled title. So we really didn't have a whole lot of avenues where we could figure out you know, there wasn't really a person we could go to and talk about the preservation of the house. There wasn't a path towards like a nonprofit owning it or anything like that. The owner of record had just died many years ago. 
they didn't leave a will and there was just really no one we could even reach out to to talk about the house so we decided with these community meetings to figure out like a kind of what is the about how does the community at large sort of value and perceive doc thrash and also if it's not if it's not possible to preserve the house itself how best can we preserve doc thrash's legacy and so through these so we partnered with community futures lab who had at the time a storefront on bridge avenue that they kind of um, offered as kind of a small little community center where um, anyone could come in and they had resources for like housing. They had like small, like rotating um, exhibits there um, or, you know, people could also just come in and hang out if they wanted to. It was kind of was this really nice sort of non-confrontational space for the community. And so, we had gone there to do these we did too we did like small kind of little workshoppy sessions and you know we bought pretzels for everybody and stuff and um one the things that we kind of found out was that you know of course the community was very well aware of who doc Spash was and the his the historic legacy was really important to them and so with that interpretation was key that they there was a desire to make sure that the history of Doc Thrash and of course all the other amazing things that were going on in the neighborhood at the time were um, being um, taught to the younger generations and that that historic legacy wouldn't get forgotten um, and then another thing is that the um, sort of connection with contemporary artists and sort of almost like reviving that culture again today was important. And then also I think really what we found out was that really the building itself, especially given the development pressures and given the amount of loss that has already happened in the neighborhood, that really preserving the house itself is important. So Great. yeah. I have a question about that, Dana. So the Dog Thrash House is actually one of a series of row houses that were built in 1895 by Harold uh, Godwin. And it was recently sold to the nonprofit developer after a whole bunch of things occurred. But just recently, I believe this, this past summer, it was recently sold to the nonprofit Beach Community Partners. And your team, which is wonderful news because it, they are actually a nonprofit with whom you are working towards this goal. And your team continues to be an advocate for the house and its preservation, including eventually perhaps even a historic marker. Um, the 2020 sale, which is actually a second sale, um, has actually moved the dream of the preservation for the docs thrash house forward tell us about that and 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 the project and and what the current state of that is yeah so yeah at first it kind of like i said we were really not sure if we were going to be able to preserve the house itself and it just there just wasn't any real clear avenue for us to do that but actually in um i think it was 20 2018 the the house was brought in for a sheriff sale. And so we kind of, you know, to the end, I guess, of preserving the house itself, we sort of kind of developed this sort of trifecta organization where we kind of bringing a development partner and a programming partner together in kind of this pursuit of preserving the house. So that was kind of our strategy, at least at the time. And so with the sheriff sale of the house, that became even more urgent <laughs> because um, like we didn't have the cash to buy the, the house. So we approached um, actually a number of people and Beach was kind of really the only one that was 
really passionate about the project and excited enough to actually take it on. And we're really grateful for them for doing that. And so um, they, I kind of, as I said before, speculative development in the neighborhood is kind of rampant. And so unfortunately they were outbid at the sheriff sale and um, we kind of were at a loss then because we thought, oh no, like what's gonna happen? Um, but um, eventually, like as you said, that things kind of turned around and they were eventually able to purchase the property, which is exciting. And um, we're very grateful for that. And so, um, so at this, so we're kind of at like a really actually optimistic time for the house right now, because um, I think Beach had issued an RFP um, a few months ago, I think it might still be on their website and you can look at their website too. They actually have a tab directly on there right now for the house. So you can check for like updates uh, from them about how the development is going. And so um, I think step one obviously is getting a architect and design team on board so they can really kind of like dig into the development and stabilization of the house. So that's kind of where we're at right now with the property. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, and also this past summer, um, you and your team, which is Maya and Chris, can you talk a little bit more about the three of you, you're all Penn grads and, and you rate actually did a capital campaign this summer. So if you could, share with everybody what you raised in that capital campaign and what those funds will be earmarked for, for the, you know, for the Docs Thrash House. Right. So over the summer, we started a capital campaign. Uh, we called it the Black Futures campaign to raise money towards the redevelopment of the house. And um, so we were really successful in that. So thank you if anyone donated. Um, and really that purpose of that money is kind of to forward sort of our initial goals that we developed from the community. And so for us as the Doc Slash House, we really wanna advocate for kind of sort of reinvigorating the neighborhood and kind of making sure that the property is a community asset that, um, reestablishes kind of that maybe that connection to, like we said before, um, uh, contemporary art, African-American artists and cultural activities. We want it to um, kind of maybe be a economic generator for the community. And also like, like we kind of said before, actually making sure that the house itself is preserved and that the as much historic fabric can be retained as possible. So that's really what our goals are as the Docs of Crash House. And um, we're really excited to see, and, and we're pretty optimistic that that is gonna be possible moving into the future. Um, and we're kind of really excited to see where the project goes, especially now that, um, we'll have a design team on board soon, so. Um, Great. So the funding that you raised is actually for pro community programs and things like that? Um, we're not 100% sure at this time exactly. Like we're not, um, so the Docs Thrash House Us, we're not like a nonprofit or anything like that. We're kind of just like an informal sort of adv advocacy group. So, mm -hmm. um, so like, yeah, we won't be like running, we as a group won't be running programs out of the house. Great. So is there anything that you'd like to add or um, is there anything that those of us that are listening can, how could we participate in this whole project in terms of assisting you with either advocacy or, you know, your fundraising program is over as I understand it. So yeah, that, I think the, I think the um, yeah it's closed at the moment. So I don't think you can donate additional funds at the, this time. Um, 
But so I think if um, people are interested, could they reach out to you or to to one of your colleagues, Chris or Maya or Allie, to to let you know that they might be interested in contributing in some some manner, you know, either volunteerism or down the line. I think that probably you're going to work on the conservation of the house first, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, we are uh, very active on social media, so feel free to uh, direct message us on Instagram. You can message us on Facebook. You can. Um, so it's the Docs Thrash House Project, correct? On Instagram? I forget exactly what our handle is because we have a few. Oh, we used to have a slide for that. I'm sorry, guys. Sorry. I'm, I'm like going to copy and paste it. it. I yeah. can paste it into the chat so people can see okay, what that it is as soon as I get it. I can't remember if it's like one of them is like docs dot house, I think is the Instagram one. And then I think Facebook. Our email is docs house at gmail.com, I believe. Okay, we've got the Instagram up. Thanks, Allie. Yeah. <laughs> so um, is there anything else, Allie, or um Dana, that you'd like to share with us before we take some questions from our audience? Um, I guess I should just plug that. Um, yeah, our our numbers have grown a little bit, and you know, I'm really grateful to have Allie and Maris, who are current students, have been on board. And in addition to myself, of course, uh, Chris and Maya are uh, my colleagues from 2016, <laughs> the class of 2016 that kind of started the group. So, and and we've had a lot of um, help from other like really passionate, really helpful um, contributors over the years. Um, so um, Evan Schuckler, who was a past Penn alum also, as well as Andrea Haley, who was also a Penn alum and, you know, some of them moved away or for various reasons weren't able to kind of continue on, but we were really grateful for whatever help and support we had from them at the time. That's great. So um, what I would like to do now, Suzanne, if we may, is to open up the, the Q&A and I will take a look at them and we can share some questions. Okay, great. Yes, we have a few questions in the, um, the Q&A and I just wanted to comment that for people who are interested um, there have been a couple of references to exhibitions, um, past exhibitions, uh, namely at the Woodmere. Um, so, so take a look at the chat. And also, um, we've been adding resources to the chat and links to two things that were mentioned in the conversation. Okay, so is Sharswood still called Sharswood Neighborhood is the first question. Um, I think actually the well, I guess I don't really know 100%, but originally it wasn't, I think Sharswood is actually the new name for it. That kind of, it got rebranded, I think, by the PHA. But I think most people really just call it like more Philly, more central. You know, that was, um, that was like one thing. Sharswood Bloomberg is what PHA refers to it. Yeah, well, it's like the, the name of their plan. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't. I think when we were doing our studio, yeah, we actually asked a lot of neighborhood residents about that, like where's Sharswood? And like, they were just like, I thought this was Strawberry Mansion. <laughs> I had, right, I had to look actually on the map to figure it out. Um, I was gonna say, we have a couple other questions. Diane and Allie, have you collaborated at all with Monument Lab? So actually Maya, who is um, one of, are, What's Maya's last name? Because you haven't mentioned her last oh, name. Oh, Maya Thomas. Yeah, she, she, um, I think she's, she's like the Monument Lab uh, organizer for Philly. <laughs> so, good. okay, good. So, uh, I'm assuming if like there was a collaborative opportunity, she would um, let us, <laughs> let us know or bring them together. So, good. So we have another question. Are you nervous about the vacant lot next door to the Doc's Thrash House? Do you have a plan to try and protect it or aspiration for purchase? Um, it definitely is kind of an intriguing opportunity, I would say so. But like a lot of other properties, it was, I think it's purchased by an LLC at the moment. And 
LLCs are almost impossible to track down. So um, it would definitely be um, nice to, <laughs> yeah, if that could be resolved, but it's uh, kind of unknown at the moment. So uh, we have a question now. Do we have knowledge of Doc Thrash's own thoughts about his time at the house? Oh, that's a good question. It is. I don't know. Um, it, there is like one um, piece that we have, or not like we don't own. Yeah, I don't own a Doc Thrash <laughs> work, but like um, there is like a, one of his works that was on the corner of, was it 25th and Ridge, which is just like a block from his house. That is like a street scene of that corner. So I kind of, um, like, I kind of look at it a lot. So I kind of would think if he, you know, took the time to just depict everyday life of his neighborhood, at least that, you know, he was really important to him and but yeah, I don't know how he felt about the house on its own. And we were actually talking about this yesterday. We were like, I wonder, like, you know, the ground floor was always a commercial space. So we were like, well, what did he use that for? Was there, did he release that as a shop or like, did he do printmaking in there? Like what happened on the ground floor? So I'm not sure. An yeah. interesting question. Very he did, question. Um, he did own it and so, um, he and his wife purchased it, um, which, you know, is pretty significant, um, at least in, in the sense of like owning property because his studio, um, which was across the street. So it probably was like, I, I speculate that it, you know, close to where his studio was that he worked with Samuel Brown. Um, so it was advantageous in that way and that it was like a pretty, um, uh, also like a prominent spot in the neighborhood along a commercial corridor. Right. We have a, a request. Could you talk a bit more about Doc Thrash's work? So I guess, oh, wait a minute, on the photo there is listed library. Is this a branch? Oh yeah, the Cecil B. Library. Okay. Um, it's right next door, or not like right next door, but you know, a couple houses down. And Ali, I guess this would be for you. Could you talk a, just a bit more about Doc Thrash's work? Um, yeah, so he he did a a few different um, kinds of work. So he did a lot of drawing, um, but it was when he came to Philadelphia that he started to get more into etchings, um, and uh, you know. By no means am I an expert in his works, but at least from what I know, um, he did he did uh, work with color print as well. Um, there are a few pieces out there um, where he does um, an etching just with black ink, but then he also reproduced the work in color. Um, so he did experiment a little bit with that, um, and he he was it seems pretty experimental with um, different etching processes, uh, but I think the, just the feel that he was able to get through the carborundum process, it really became his, like his medium um, in his, the, in the mature part of his um, artist life. I think he was quite remarkable for the time as well that he was able to exhibit all over the country mm -hmm. and that his printmaking was very renowned, um, not only in Philadelphia, but elsewhere. Um, yeah, he had exhibits all the way in San Francisco. And um, so it, it really was, he really was nationally renowned. The Philadelphia Museum did a beautiful catalog from the uh, 2001 exhibition. So at, as an artist rediscovered. So that's a wonderful resource as well. I wanted to add. Do we have any other questions in the chat? 
I might have one more. Well, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I really want to thank Allie and Dana for their, their vision and their enthusiasm for really making a difference in Philadelphia. I think I am always amazed to see how the Penn community goes out and does things after graduation for the communities that they live in. Excuse me. <clears throat> And I would invite you all to uh, do two things. Today, the Arthur Ross Gallery is closed due to ice, but I would encourage you to go online if you're able and you're in the city or on campus. We do have free time tickets for you to see the exhibition, uh, Many Voices, Many Visions. So I encourage you to do that. If you can't get to uh, Pennsylvania and you are um, joining us from away, as they say, um, I would encourage all of you actually to go online to arthurrossgallery.org and to have a, a sample of the images and artworks in the exhibition with descriptions. And that's live on our website as a virtual exhibition. Thank you all for joining us and stay safe, stay warm and take care of yourselves and and one another. And Thank Lynn, you. Um, if, if the three of you have more time, um, we did have a question that was uh, entered into the chat um, just recently, uh, oh. asking if Dax Thrash was recognized in his time. Yeah, I mean, he did yeah. have um, those uh, national exhibitions, but I, I think he also had like an exhibition like in Europe too. Yeah. there. There was talk he's been he went to Paris a couple of times um, for exhibitions and um, uh, I think it was the Philadelphia Inquirer or um, there were a, a few newspapers and magazines in Philadelphia that um, really uh, prominently talked about him and talked about him in, in very positive light. Yeah, and I think there's actually, uh, I guess we didn't show that photo, but there's like another photo from John Mosley where he's like accepting an award that was given to him from the Pyramid Club too. So definitely well-respected, highly regarded community member and yeah. And I think someone in the chat also said to, to um, go on the website for the Woodmere. I believe they also have his work. I didn't mention the Woodmere, but that, that would certainly be an obvious one. Um, That's right. And I do want to say, um, everybody is, thank you for coming um, and you're welcome to go, but we do have another question in the chat, <laughs> which is, um, could you subscribe? Uh-huh. I'm sorry. Would you like to share the question in the chat? Yes. Um, could you describe the print process, uh, the, describe the print process he invented? And um, I know that I was wondering if you would like me to pull up the um, print that's in Many Voices, Many Visions um, for this question. Uh, I see that Evan has requested that. Evan, I am not a printmaker. Uh, what I can explain is that the carborundum was used to actually, uh, uh, is a method of eliminating the, um, the, the crayon that you use, the lithographic crayon to reuse a stone plate of a lithograph. And that is a, you know, a fairly strong, you know, surface, even though it's stone, but he used it on the copper plates. And so that I imagine that the crystals or the technique would, you know, increase the density of the, rather than the etching. I should, probably should ask a printmaker before I begin to explain this process to you. Um, but the fact that he took something that was used to resurface a lithographic stone and used it on a copper plate gave him the possibility of getting these, these incredible tonalities, if you will, of darkness and light, the chiaroscuro. And this kind of um, almost a drawn effect, you'll see that, that 
is very different from, from my point of view than a, a very thin etching line. Um, Great, and to point um, Evan and others to the chat, uh, June is um, adding uh, some information. Somebody actually said good, because <laughs> somebody has given us a link to YouTube about how to use the technique. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Maris. <laughs> uh, and thank, thank you, Maris, we appreciate that. Was he recognized outside of the African American community? Absolutely, because if the director in the 1940s of the Philadelphia Museum and the curator uh, knew and were inspired by his work and collected his work, absolutely, he was known. Any other questions, Suzanne, in the chat? I don't think so. There's a lot of um, thanks. And again, for people who are staying on, there is some information in the chat. Um, and so get in touch if you would like, like further follow up on that. Great. Well, we are very thrilled to have a Docs Thresh uh, print in the university collection. And of course, we're always excited to acquire by gift, works of art by African-American artists. So I just wanted to add that too, wearing my other hat as the university curator. But thank you again, everybody, for taking time out of your day. And um, thank you, um, Ali and Dana, for your participation and to your colleagues for this really inspiring um, program about what you are doing in a wonderful neighborhood in Philadelphia. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Have a wonderful Thank afternoon. Thank you, Lynn and Susan, for um, inviting us and, and having us talk. Yep. Thank you so much. And thanks for listening. <laughs> All right. Goodbye, everyone. All right. Thank you. Bye.